Okay, welcome to CS4510-12-1, uh, and we will be starting a new unit. We're done with computability theory. I've uh, presented almost everything I know, and today's topic is going to be an introduction to complexity theory. So if you recall, on the syllabus, I asked two questions. I asked what are the fundamental limits of computation? And we answer that using computability theory. The second question was, what makes some problems easy and others hard? So this is the question that complexity theory attempts to answer. So before we can get into this, I need to give you guys a refresher on things you probably learned in algorithms. So I want to say, uh, so first we're going to talk about some big O notation, and we'll talk about some classes. So uh, big O of, a, of the runtime of an algorithm. So big O, uh, let F and G be functions from the natural numbers to the real numbers, positive real numbers. And uh, we say f is, say f of n is o of g of n. Sometimes this is written as equals. But f of n is o of g of n. Uh, if there exists some constant c and some uh, asymptotic floor and not uh, such that f of n is less than or equal to c g of n for all uh, n greater than or equal to n not. Basically what this is saying and is that at the limit f of n behaves asymptotically like less than g of n. You could think of this O as also like hiding constants. So for example, uh, n cubed is O of n k for any k greater than or equal to 3. Uh, so n cubed is n cubed is O of n cubed. n cubed is O of n to the fourth and so on. but but uh, n cubed is not uh, of n squared. We can also define uh, its companion, which is called little o notation. Uh, so we say uh, let again be uh, functions uh, from the natural numbers to the positive real numbers. We say uh, f of n is little o of g of n, and again, sometimes you could say equals, if, if there exists some c and some n not, uh, such that f of n is less than a c g of n. for all n greater than or equal to n not. So the difference here between this is that this is not an equals. This is uh, not less than or equal to. So for example, n cubed would not be little o of n cubed. This is sort of like a strict upper bound and not just an asymptotic upper bound. So for example, uh, to, to, to clarify the example, f of n is never uh, o of f of n. Right. Another way to write this uh, is that you can, uh, another definition, which is personally less intuitive, but it, it can help in certain in, uh, situations. We say that, it, it, that f of n is little o of g of n if the limit of n goes to infinity of f of n over g of n is zero. 
So g of n always doesn't grow asymptotically the same as f of n. It has to grow faster. Okay, there's two more big O things I want to talk about. Let's talk about uh, big omega, which is more than, probably my favorite of the bunch. Uh, let f and g uh, be functions again from the natural numbers to the positive real numbers. Uh, we say that f n is omega, uh, big omega of g of n if uh, there exists constant c and uh, n not uh, such that f of n is strictly greater than or equal to c g of n uh, for all n greater than or equal to n not. This is just like a lower bound. That's the analog. I could also define a little omega, but I'm not going to. You could think of it analogous to the little o. There are actually multiple definitions of big omega that are conflicting, but let's just go with this one. Uh, finally, we say big theta. We have theta. We say let uh, f and g be again, be functions that go from our, uh, from the naturals to the positive reals. We say that uh, f of n is big theta of g of n if it is true that uh, f of n is both omega of g of n and uh, f of n is big O of g of n. So basically it means it's it's like it's not both lower and upper. It's like bounded from both above and below asymptotically. So these are what we're going to be using um, when we talk about uh, the thing. This should just be a refresher from the analysis of al al from your analysis of algorithms course. So on halting Turing machines, we have these things called complexity measures where we can talk about the amount of time or space or other things that a Turing machine takes to do in order to solve a certain problem, to decide a language, right? A complexity measure Complexity measure is a classification of languages and the resources used to, I'll say, decide them. So the most popular one, of course, is going to be time. So we say the, consider the the complexity class time of f of n is the set of all languages which can be decided by a Turing machine which takes uh, O of f of n steps. Similarly, a uh, space of f of n, this is the amount of space the Turing machine uses. So if you recall, I called an LBA space of n. This is like the space, this is like the same thing. This, the, the, and n here is going to be the size of the input. So this is the set of languages decidable by a Turing machine, which uses no more than O of n space. That's what the LBAs are. Instead of uh, steps, it uses space. Sometimes a language will need exponential space to decide it. You know, sometimes you uh, need a regular languages use constant space, right? The DFA is finite in size. You iterate over the DFA on the tape that's bounded, that's finite. So, for example, the regular languages would be constant space. Before I was younger and naive and I was fast 
and loose footed and I would tell you that in computability theory the model doesn't matter because they're all Turing complete I spend a lot of time telling you that they were Turing complete and proving them here though the model does matter it actually does matter what kind of Turing machine we're talking about so you may assume that the model is a one-way deterministic Turing machine To give you an example, uh, I'm going to show you the language of palindromes uh, takes n squared on a one-way TM, but you can do it in linear time on a two-tape TM. So consider We'll call it PAL. Language of palindromes is equal to this for any x in sigma star uh, such that x equals its own reverse. So here's the one tape idea, the one way uh, one tape idea. We can't really do much on the one way one tape. What we can do is just go check the first element, check the cell, second element. Check the, uh, excuse me, check the first element, check the last element, see if they're the same. Okay, good. Then check the second to last element, and then go check the first element. So what I'm, what I'm saying here is, here's two ideas, okay? Here's the tape. Suppose the input is on the tape, right? What we can do is we read the first cell, then we go check the, the last cell to see if they're the same. Then we could go and check the second cell and check this, but that would actually take a little more steps and we check this cell and then we check this cell to see if it's the same you see what I'm doing so we sort of repeatedly have to loop back and forth over the over the tape so the amount of steps is going to be well the first one is going to take n steps it's going to take n steps the second one is going to take n minus two steps because we're not doing these two that so we do n steps we do one step then we do n minus two steps then we do one step then we do n minus four steps and so on right so the amount of steps is we're going to do n over two half steps, and then we're going to do uh, n plus n over n minus two plus n minus four plus dot dot dot, uh, and then plus n over two. So you may recall one plus two plus three plus four plus dot 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 plus n. This is equal to n times n plus one over two. We can do something similar. We're going to write this as the sum of i equals 1 to n, not 2n, but of 2i. Well, we can pull the 2 out and we get 2 times the sum of i equals 1 of i to n, which is equal to 2 times n uh, times n plus 1 over 2. And then we have this term again because we're doing these constant steps, n over 2 times plus n over 2. Well, this is going to be, the big O of this is going to be n squared. Do you agree? There's an n here, there's an n here. The dominating term asymptotically of this is going to be n squared. It's going to, it's going to eat this term, right? So on a one-way tape, it takes n squared. In fact, using Kolmogorov complexity and a proof that I won't do, you can't actually do much better than this on a one-way, one-tape Turing machine. Through some, it was and this was an open open question for a very long time. Eventually, in the early '90s, somebody solved it. They were able to prove that it's actually asymptotic. You can't do much better, which is kind of interesting because, you know, the first idea everyone thinks of to decide this language is just to brute force check it. It's n squared, but this proof shows you really can't do much better than that. There's no point of thinking about it in a smarter way. Now consider the one-way uh, two tape idea. So we have two tapes. The first tape is initialized with the input and the second tape is initialized blanks. So the input is going to be here and the uh, second blank tape is going to be here, right? And these, by the way, are infinite. Don't forget that. What we're going to do is copy the input 
to the second tape, reset one of the heads, it doesn't actually matter which one, then move them in opposite directions towards each other, checking them off at one at a time. So copy input to second tape. So what that means is we're going to read this cell copy, read this cell copy, read this cell copy, read this cell copy, and so on. And then the head will eventually be at the end of the input. So move a first tape head back to cell one. So when the after we copy the cell, we're going to copy here. We're going to see the space. We're going to stop and move back here. I'm saying that we reset the head all the way to here for this one, but not for this one. So then it's going to look like uh, here's our here's our tape, right? So the the tape head cell is going to be here for that one, and then for this one, the tape head cell is going to be here, right? So then what we're going to do is we're going to move the tape head this way and move the tape head this way, and as we do, we're going to be checking uh, if they're the same or not. Loop over input tape heads towards each other checking. Step one, we'll call this step one, we'll call this step two, we'll call this step three. Step one, copy inputs, takes O of N, takes N steps, right? Move the tape head back to cell one. You have to loop back, takes n steps. Loop over input, tape heads towards each other. So as you do though, so it's going to take uh, to the halfway point. So it's going to take n over two. And this whole thing is less than, well, this one, this whole thing is actually, it's actually 2.5n, which is uh, less than uh, 3n, which is O of n. The jump to a two tape Turing machine sped us up. It sped us up from uh, quadratic to linear. And you may think, well, that's great. Why don't we just use the two tape model? You know, and the answer is to the real world, in some cases, it still doesn't really matter. So let me just give you the complexities of translation of several common models. So we have a one tape TM. Uh, I'll call it one TM. We have a KTM, which is K is greater than or equal to two is a multi-tape TM. And then we have what you would understand as a, com a computer is what I'm going to call a RAM machine. A RAM machine is like, you could think of this as like a pseudocode, just something that you could do on a, on a computer. It stands for random access memory. So when you want to read a cell, you don't have to loop all the way to the cell. You can just like call the address of the cell and it tells you the value. So why don't I just make the table for this? Say this is y, and we'll say this is the x row. So, I, and to simulate a y on x, right? So, so first off, you can, if the RAM model takes t steps, you can simulate it on the RAM model in t steps. This is going to be obvious. To simulate a one tm tape on a ktm tape takes t steps. To simulate a ktm tape on a one tm tape. Actually, this takes t squared. To simulate the RAM model on the KT on the K tape Turing machine, this is going to be like t squared. To simulate the K tape TM on the RAM model, this is like t log t. And recall that t is the number of steps that the K tape TM would halt in. So then the RAM model would halt in uh, t log t. So one way to simulate the RAM model on the one tape TM is that you simulate uh, the RAM model on a K tape TM. And then you simulate the K tape TM on a one tape TM. So this is like T to the fourth. Then to simulate a one tape TM on a RAM model, it's just, you go, you simulate the one tape TM on the K TM. So it's going to take T and then you simulate the K tape TM on the RAM model, which is going to be T log T. So it's just T log T. These might seem like vastly different and unequal complexities, but they're all polynomial. So, it depends who you ask if you should care about this. I have a cryptographic background, 
So that means in cryptography, in theoretical cryptography, if something is polynomial, that's good enough. I can go to bed. I don't care anymore. If you're, if you've ever actually had to do programming, you've probably had experience where there's like an n to the eighth algorithm, which is really slow on certain inputs, and then you know an n to the eighth algorithm is basically unusable uh, for a lot of things. You get an n squared algorithm, it's like okay, fine, you can leave it alone. If you get linear or n log n, it's you know it's good to go. You can leave it in production. So it really depends. Of these things which might interest you, I'm gonna prove to you we can uh, simulate a two-way TM on a one-way TM in O of N. This might be surprising to you, first of all, because there's like twice as much tape. Uh, but the idea is we're going to simulate both tapes on one tape at the same time. We're going to sort of fold the tape over itself and just roll with it, right? So how should I draw this? All right, so take, imagine I took the two-way tape and I fold it in half, right? And then let's say this is the cell... These are some of the cells on it. Ignore this fold I, I did here. Right? Imagine I folded it perfectly in half. Let's say this has A, this has B, this has C, this has D, this has E, and this has F. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to simulate two cells on one cell at a time. So we're going to transform this to the one-way tape which is going to look like, uh, I'll actually draw it a little taller. And this is, of course, going to go on for infinite. This is going to look like A uh, slash B, uh, C uh, slash D, uh, E slash F, and so on. So given some tape alphabet, uh, we can construct a new tape alphabet, gamma squared, which I will use the notation of the slash. So we'll say this is like A slash B, uh, such that A, B are in gamma. Right. And then we sort of copy the Turing machine with some extra steps. If we go past the halfway point on this Turing machine, if we start going left into, quote unquote, the negative part of the tape, here we just flip it around and say, keep going right, but then start computing over uh, the bottom of the tape. Right, so this tape actually looked like uh, F, D, B, A, uh, A, C, E. So there's some some inv invisible, uh, you know, access here. You can assume, and. If we would move left in this Turing machine, we're actually going to move right, but then compute on the bottom. So let's say if we were to write B and re replace it with uh, B prime, instead uh, instead of writing B, uh -huh. instead of over writing uh, B with B prime, uh, we overwrite a slash b with a slash b prime. This is the sort of way we simulate the two-way tape on the one-way tape. And at each step, it takes you exactly one step with some constant amount of work uh, for this translation. So it's actually like uh, 4t of n. Uh, if the first one ran in T of N, so this is O of N. And finally, it's just worth briefly mentioning, I won't prove it because it's actually quite involved, but uh, you let U be the universal Turing machine, which takes on input M and some W, and it'll simulate M on W uh, if M halts in T steps 
uh, u halts in uh, t log t steps. So it's this is this is as efficient as we know. You might need this for proofs. Again, I made some exemplary uh, table about why the model does matter. You know, you have these all these uh, different terms, but they're all polynomials. So to that, I I can give you this what's called the stronger uh, Church Turing thesis. And all this says is, recall the Church-Turing thesis is that every computational model can be simulated on a Turing machine. The stronger Church-Turing thesis is the same thing, except that it adds on the fact that every computational model can be simulated on a Turing machine with at most polynomial overhead. Every computational model can be simulated on a Turing machine with at most polynomial overhead. This is also worth mentioning that this is controversial. We don't have as much good uh, supporting evidence as we do of just the plain church Turing thesis. And there might even be some contradictory uh, evidence. You know, the existence of quantum computers can solve what we believe to be a classically exponential time algorithm can be solved in polynomial time on a quantum computer. That would imply then that the quantum computer could not be efficiently simulated on a Turing machine with that much polynomial overhead. And right now, the quantum simulators you can run on computers are exponential. There is no evidence, though, that we can physically build like a perfect and good quantum computer yet. We can get pretty close, and they have lots of errors and all kinds of things. But maybe this question will be answered in 20 years. Who knows?